Hello everybody and welcome to Crofton Roman Villa which is run by the Kent Archaeological Rescue Unit with support from Bodley Council. I'm about to take you inside and show you some of the remains of the villa that was excavated and have a look at some of the artefacts that were discovered during that excavation as well. So here we are standing in the ruins of the Roman Villa that was stood here approximately 2,000 years ago. Now people were in fact living on this site before then um, there were Iron Age people living in this local area, they were called the Celts, and they were farmers. They lived in wattle and daub roundhouses made of sticks that were woven in and out to make a fence, and then all sorts of mud and poo and everything slapped on the outside in order to keep the wind and the rain out. Their roofs were actually thatched, made of straw and grass and everything, so that the, all the smoke from the fire inside would be able to permeate out. They had sometimes little scuffles amongst themselves, but generally they just got on with their farming lives. However, over in Italy, in the rest of Europe, there was something a brewing. The Romans, who came from Rome, hence the name, um, were busy spreading out across Europe, wanting to conquer as much land as possible to be, in order to be able to come, become as rich and powerful as possible. They'd spread out through Spain, through Germany, through France, and in, then in AD 43, the emperor gave the order for 30,000 Roman soldiers to set sail from France over to Britain and conquer Britain. So these Roman soldiers, they would have been to army camp, they were incredibly well trained, they had all sorts of armour and weapons and things like that as well. Here's a picture of one, so you can see he's got all his armour on, he's got a massive great shield to protect him, shield, spear, sword, everything that he's going to need. The Celts put up a big fight. They tried so hard to, in order to ward off the Roman invasion, but in the end, unfortunately, um, the might and the power of the Roman weapons and armour and everything was just too strong, and so the Celts were defeated. Um, then the Roman soldiers could get on with the business of living here. They built lots of roads, they built lots of towns and cities, one of them you might have heard of, for example, their capital city was called Londinium. That's right, it's where London is today. And they also built this place here, this Roman villa. Now, villa actually means farm, okay? This was a farmhouse 2,000 years ago. And this is what we think it used to look like. So you can see, it was out in the middle of the countryside there. It wasn't surrounded by all these roads and houses that we have around us today out in the middle of the countryside, lots of fields where they could grow their crops and look after their animals. Down the bottom of the hillside was this river. Um, this was their source of water, and nowadays this river actually runs along the route of Orkham to High Street. It's still there in pipes, but back in Roman times you could actually get to it and collect water from it. So, as I said, I am currently standing in the ruins of this Roman villa. It doesn't look like the picture anymore, it's all fallen down because it got all buried over those 2,000 years. In fact, if you'd been here uh, even just 30 years ago, you wouldn't have a clue that this place was here. Now, this is when it got discovered again, which is a very exciting event. Bromley Council wanted to build a car park all over this area, but because of various little excavations and when people were building the railways um, during Victorian times and things, the archaeologists knew that there was something here, something possible, possibly important that needed to be found. So they went to Bromley Council and said, please can we come in and do a bit of digging and make sure that, that what is here, if there is anything, is properly recorded so that the information is not lost forever. And Bromley Council went, yeah, okay, you can come in. So they gave us 10 weeks, 70 days to do the excavation. So the archeologist jumped into action. They had to put on their hard hats, make sure they were nice and protected from any fallen dirt, and they had to grab their tools. Now, here I've got a spade. You can tell it's a spade because it's got a nice flat blade, perfect for digging down through the earth, okay? So, we dunk, 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 dunk. On the first day, we found nothing. Carried on digging. Second day, we found Third day we found <gasps> on the third day there was a ding 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 
some deep and found some rocks. So we had to put down the spades and pick up these tools instead. Now, these are called trowels, okay? And they're usually quite a lot longer and pointed, but they're used for crouching down and scraping, scraping, scraping the earth away gently because we can't be using great hefty tools when you're working with 2,000 year old artifacts because it just might damage them too much. So we've got to be ever so careful, ever so delicate when you're scraping away. So over the next nine and a half weeks, the archeologists managed to excavate the whole of what you can see in front of you here and a little bit more besides. There were over 10 rooms that were found and so many different pieces of pottery and things. If you look, look at the plan up there of the Roman villa, what you can see in front of you here, this area, is actually the orange and the green bit there. You see that, that sort of triangular section? That's the bit that I'm standing in here. The archaeologists also discovered that the walls that the Roman villa was made from were very, very different to the walls that the, pre the previous people, the Celts, had been building their houses with. These walls were so sturdy, really great hefty chunky things made of flint um, in, interspersed with layers of tile just to give it that extra bit of stability. And the flint, this, this is a local stone, this flint, local flint stuck together with their cement. So proper hefty sturdy walls we've got here. And they look a bit rough and ready today, don't they? It looks a bit knobbly, but back in Roman times it would have been covered with lots and lots of wall plaster that they could smooth out to a nice smooth finish and then paint all bright colours. The archaeologists think that um, the walls would have been painted with lots of red and green patterns in this particular villa. They also discovered the remnants of the floors that the Romans had in this villa as well. Now, one type of floor was this floor over here, which was made of the special Roman concrete. This is called opus signinum floor, okay? And it would have been really strong and hard wearing. Another type of floor that they had um, was a kind of boring version of something that the Romans are very, very famous for having. I hope all of you have heard of mosaics, where the Romans would use tiny, tiny little pieces of coloured tile and glass put together, a little bit like a jigsaw puzzle, in order to create a pattern or a picture on their floor. Here at Crofton, we didn't find any mosaics, but we did find the poor man's version, the tessellated floor. And these tessellated floors were made of, instead of brightly coloured pieces of tile and glass, they were made of these red cubes of clay. But they were still put together like a jigsaw puzzle. And if you look over here, over in room 11, you can actually see this section, this section of the passageway. It's 2,000 years old. Just imagine, 2,000 years ago, a little Roman child might have been running along that corridor to go to their bedroom or something like that. I think that's pretty amazing, don't you? Definitely. Now, after the Romans had been here for a while, they decided to do some home improvements. Just like nowadays, when people have been living in that house for a bit, they might want to build an extension or something like that. The Romans were very keen on home improvements too. They built extensions, multiple extensions to their house over time, and also, they started realising it's a little bit chilly here in Britain, much colder than it is over in Italy where they come from. So they installed this part here that I'm standing in. This was their central heating system and it was called the hypercorst, means underfloor heating. And it was very clever how they did it. What they had to do was they had to dig down through their open signal floor in here in room 9 in order to create a stoke hole. And in this stoke hole, all their slaves would keep a constant fire going, feeding it with logs and sticks and twigs, making sure that the fire didn't go out. The fire would heat all the warm air inside there, and then the warm air would be able to come through this hole in the wall that they cut, through this archway, 
and then be able to swirl around, twirl around all of these pillars of tiles that we've got here. Now, ground level was here. This is where the people would have been walking around on, and so all the warm air would be able to swirl around underneath, including going in here. And then whenever somebody trod on this part, they would be able to feel the warm air underneath, and it would make the floor feel warm. This is how they heated their house, by keeping the floors nice and warm, by all the hot air swirling around underneath. Now, the hot air has got to go somewhere though, hasn't it? It can't just stay here. It needs to escape and be replaced with some new air. So what they would needed to do was also cut some holes, so cut some little niches into the walls and install these sorts of tiles. Now these are kind of like little chimneys. They would have these all piled on top of each other and up into the roof where they, the hot air could escape. But as the hot air was coming up through the box flue tiles, if you put your hand on the wall there, you would actually be able to feel the hot air passing through. And so not only have you got warm floors, you've also got warm walls as well. Sounds pretty cosy, doesn't it? <laughs> so, with all of these wonderful mod cons that they'd installed into their house, Romans were actually able to live here on this site, in this house, for about 400 years overall. Pretty long time. However, but at the end of those 400 years, uh, something bad was happening in Rome. Rome was being attacked by the barbarians coming, coming south, south from Germany, and Rome was under attack. The army got recalled from Britain, had to go back to Rome in order to help defend it against these barbarians. So the army left Britain. Now, once the army had left, the people living here started to feel not quite so secure about living here as they had previously. Um, started to feel like it might be a little bit dangerous, especially since um, the Anglo-Saxons had started invading Britain as well. So it was all a little bit unsure, unstable. People weren't really happy living here anymore. So one day, the family who was living here, they just upped and they left. And they never came back. Now, as we know, when houses um, become abandoned, they fall into a bit of disrepair, don't they? They, they don't just stay nice and pristine. They need people to look after them. There's nobody to look after them. They start collapsing. The walls start crum crumbling down. The roof tiles fall off. Any windows completely smash and fall down. And so over time, the whole thing came tumbling down, which is why you can see that these walls aren't ordinary house height walls now, like we have nowadays. They used to be. They used to be ordinary house height walls, but they've just collapsed over time. And we were just left with these ruins. Now, over 2,000 years, these ruins got covered up. All the hill wash, all the soil and dirt and everything washed down the hill by the rain, and it got covered up, and then covered up, and then covered up, and then covered up. And so over time, great huge amount of soil, over 2,000 years, a lot of soil was able to cover over this area, so that when the archeologists turned up 30 years ago, nobody knew it was here until the archaeologists discovered it. Now, as you might remember, Bromley Council wanted to build a car park on this site. Luckily, you can see that we have no car park, have we? We've still got this villa open for everyone to come and see. And that's because after the 10 weeks that the archaeologists had, and they'd uncovered all of this, they held an open day. And do you know what? 2,000 people turned up on that open day, and Bromley Council went, hang on a second, this is actually a really important site. Maybe we'd better give it to you guys, give it to the archaeologists, give it to Kent Archaeological Rescue Unit, and say, please open it up and allow other people, and lots and lots of school children just like yourselves, can come along and visit this place. Make sure that the knowledge isn't lost and everybody gets to see what an amazing place this is. If you remember, I was telling you about how this Roman villa was a farmhouse back 2,000 years ago. But how do we know it was a farmhouse? I haven't got a time machine that I can go backwards and find out firsthand. So how do we actually know? How do the archaeologists actually know? By the power of rubbish. Archaeologists absolutely love rubbish. Now I know that's a really, really weird thing to say, but you can find out so much because 
back in 2000 years ago, the Romans didn't have big men that came along and took their rubbish away. So what the Romans ha used to have to do was kind of throw it out the window, dig a hole, bury it. And then that means that when the archaeologists come along 2000 years later and start digging down with their trowels, down, 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 they discover all of this rubbish, the Roman rubbish. And that can tell us so much about what the Romans had and how, about how they lived. Here is some of the Roman rubbish that was discovered from this site. Now, it was a farm, so you're going to have some animals on the farm, aren't you? What sort of animals are you going to have? How about cow? Maybe there were some cows standing out in the fields there, chewing the cud, standing out on their legs. Here's a cow leg. And so because we've got evidence of cow, then that shows us that the Romans must have had milk. Um, and then you can get all the butter, the cream, the yogurt, all of that. You've also got the beef, yum, yum, yum. Lots of juicy steaks for the, for the Romans. And of course, then they would use, be able to use the leather as well from the cow skin in order to help make their um, sandals and things like that. So we've got cows. What other animals do we find? Sheep. We've got some sheep as well, so imagine this animal 2,000 years ago gambling around in the wonderful green fields. If you've got sheep, then you've also got the lamb or the mutton, the meat, um, and of course you've got the wool, which they would, would be incredibly important to help um, make their clothes, help keep them warm on these cold British hills, hillsides. What else have we got? Oh, we've got some pig too. Now, look, look at that. Thin, graceful, delicate sheep compared to fat, chunky pig. Imagine that animal rolling around in the mud, having a grand old time, wouldn't he? If you've got pig, then you're going to, the Romans must have had sausages, bacon, ham, all of those sorts of delicious things. We've also got one of these too. This is a goat. Here you can see, it's a goat skull. So here you can see where its eyes would have been. We've got its horns, not its ears, these are its horns and its flat little forehead for butting things. Now, goat milk was actually more common to be used in Roman times than cow milk. So you'd get goat's butter, goat's milk, goat's cheese. Goats would have been a very valuable animal to have on the farm. Now, what else have we got? Oh, we've also got this thing here. Now, this is the deer, uh, an antler from a deer. Now this deer wouldn't have lived on the farm. It would have lived up in the woodland at the top of the hill up there. And you boys, it would be your job to go out in the woodland with your bows and arrows and your spears and you would be in charge of hunting one of these and then bringing it back to the farm in order to help supplement the diet even further. Because it must have been a pretty hefty animal, wasn't it? I mean, imagine the size of the animal to have two of these stuck on its head like that. It must have been so strong and powerful. There were other animals on the farm as well that, didn't, that weren't just for giving foods. They were actually working animals. Now, in order to tell you about those, I actually have to tell you about the roof tiles. I know that sounds strange, but you'll find out why. Now, these are the roof tiles. They're big square slabs of clay with bits jutting up in between that the curved one can go over the top and then it'll put, be put together and then that will keep the rain out of the house. Now, these are made of clay. As you know, if you've used clay at school, you know it's quite wet and squiddy to start with, isn't it? But then if you leave it out in the air, then it dries and goes solid. That's how the Romans made their roof tiles. They would get some squidgy clay, shape it into the shape that they wanted, and then they'd leave it out in the farmyard, under the sun, under the hot sun, to dry out, it would go hard, and then it would be ready to build their roofs with. However, one day, while one of these roof tiles was out in the courtyard, drying away merrily, a pesky horse came along. A pesky horse came along and trod in the clay while it was still a little bit squidgy. So you can see you've got that footprint there. That shows we've got horses, very useful animals, horses. Not only that, a dog did it as well. Here we've got a dog footprint. So that shows that the Romans must have had dogs on this farm. That's pretty cute, isn't it? If you think that's cute, wait till you see this one. Look at that tiny little footprint! It's so cute! That's a little kitten! Now cats would have been so valuable on the farm because they would have helped 
chase away all the rats and everything from eating the grain that they were trying to store. And here's the evidence. This is how we know. Roman rubbish. Now, as well as all these animals giving the Romans lots and lots of protein in their diets, they were also been having fish as well, seafood. Here we've got some oyster shells and loads of these were found on the site. We've got oyster shells, we've also got some cockles and whelks as well, so a big variety. Now, how did they get here? We are miles away from the sea right now, and these are definitely sea creatures, so they wouldn't have been uh, like salty water, so they wouldn't have been living in the river that was down the bottom of the hill. So they actually got here through, through trade. Maybe one farmer would take a cow to market, and then people living down the, on the coast would collect some oysters and then they'd put them in a basket and bring them to the mar market. And he'd go, oh, I like your cow. They'd go, oh, I like your oyster. So then they'd swap and trade. The cow would go back down to the coast and the oyster would come back here for the people living in this villa to eat too. Now, in this little cooking pot here, we've got a little friend. It's a dormouse. This is a pretend dormouse. But Dormouse was actually a dish in Roman times. They used to catch them up in the woods there, keep them in cages, fatten them up with all sorts of cream and delicious things like that. And then one day, they'd bash them on the head, stuff them with herbs and spices and things, and roast them in the, in the oven for dinner. Do you fancy roast Dormouse for dinner? No, I don't really either. So the Romans had lots and lots of different sorts of pots that they would use for lots of different functions. We've got the cooking bowls, we've got eating bowls, cups, cooking utensils, and these sorts of things. These are called amphora, and they're gigantic storage jars. If I just show you, that, that's a replica one, but if I just show you part of the real one, you can see how thick it would have been. Massive great cur curvature all the way around. So we've got that's a bit of the wall and then every amphora was a very strange shape because it was pointed at the bottom so here we've got an example of a 2000 year old amphora point now because they were pointed at the bottom when they were shipped over from the continent from france they had to come across on the boats in racks so they'd all be standing up next to each other in racks and they'd have to be lent in the corner when they arrived at somebody's house now Usually these had wine in, lots of wine. The Romans loved wine. Usually quite a lot um, safer to drink than the water as well. So children would drink quite a lot of wine too. Um, sometimes it might have lots of olive oil in and sometimes it might come across filled to the brim with licuamen. Now licuamen is, is a rotten fish sauce that the Romans liked. See, because the Romans didn't have fridges, then it meant that, meant that their meat would go off quite quickly, which then didn't taste very nice. So the Romans thought, I know, to cover up the taste, of the horrible taste of this rotting meat, let's pour a sauce that's made of rotting fish on top of it. I know, I don't quite get it either, but that, apparently the Romans absolutely loved it. So maybe this might have been filled with liquid Now, this one's a replica, so it's light and I can lift it by myself. But if it was full of wine, then it would definitely be a two-person job to do. So one person would be able to hold the handles, the other person would have to crouch all the way down to the bottom, put their hands around the base, around the point at the base, and then on the count of three, they would lift it up and then be able to pour it out into a bucket. Once it's in the bucket, then they can grab one of the jugs, scoop it up, and then be able to serve it out to the important guests like that. So that's the end of the tour. I hope you've enjoyed learning a little bit more about the Roman villa that we've got and some of the finds that we found and the, finding out what life must have been like in living here in the villa about 2000 years ago. If you want to come and visit yourselves, we are open. Please check our website for details for opening times and we look forward to seeing you very soon. Go Romans! <laughs>